Good evening, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. <coughs> My name is Tom Squares, and I'm the Regional Vice President for ACM Community Management. And on behalf of Carl Kohanek and ACM, thank you all for being here tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, a couple things I want to do is, first of all, I want to introduce some of the ACM personnel that are here. And we'll start in the back with Carl. Kohanek is in the back. He's our president and owner of the company. everybody. Thank you for coming. And then we've got Don Francesi, our CFO, is back here. And I know Paul Joya was going to be joining us sometime. He's our general manager. And then I'm going to go ahead and introduce some of our managers. Of course, we have Mary Siegel up here in the front. We have Viviana Valentino, who's our director of special projects and marketing. And in the back, we have Iris Rodriguez, a property manager, Melissa Kahn, a regional manager, Lori Barker a property manager, and I think that that's all of the ACM personnel. I apologize if I missed anybody. I think what we want to do real quickly, so that uh, Michael can, and Mary kind of get a feeling for everybody that's here, if we could just run around the room really quickly and introduce yourself and what association you're from. So if Cynthia, you could start. Oh, which association should I start? <laughs> the one you live at. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm Cynthia Holker, I'm with Portsmouth Condominiums, and I have a rental property at Lyle Place. I'm Dick Weissman. I'm with Waters Edge from Winona. Thank you for coming. Gary Schrader, Shadow Bend in Wheeling. Mark Coleman, uh, Waverly Court in Wheaton. Jack Thu with Windridge of Naperville Condominium Association. Dave Geiger, Fox Ridge in Fox Lake, Illinois. Thank you. Jane Schaefer, Billy Connors in Mount Westbrook. Jimmy Schaff, Village Power in Mount Westbrook. Keith Stanton, Woodridge Park Lane 2, Woodridge. Kelly Kramer, um, Green. Green. sorry, <laughs> Glendale Heights, sorry, in Glendale Heights. Okay. Kathy Cross, Greens of Glendale Heights in Glendale Heights. Tom Heath, the fellas in uh, Hawk Hollow in Bartlett. Thank you. Ryan Orchard Lane here in uh, Glen Hall. Uh, Rich Rayberger, Oakview Estates in Lombard. Linda Butcher, uh, Village on the Lake Condominiums, Oak Grove. Yuri Ostrowski, Village on the Lake Condominiums, Oak Grove. Marcin Bolski, uh, Ashbury Woods Injustice. Chris Wagner, Asbury Woods uh, Justice. Also brand new to ACM, January 1. There you go. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kirk Wood, uh, the Greens in Glendale Heights. Cheryl Wood, Greens. Uh, why is it coming out <laughs> The Greens. Towns of Auburn Lakes and Plainfield. Bob Zirko, Towns of Auburn Lakes and Plainfield. Reed Hinkley, also from the same place. Okay. <laughs> Mike Waldo from uh, Footsay Condos in Streamwood. Juan Stavonich, Bell Tower Place in Bloomingdale. Suzanne Stamina, Turnberry Manor in Roselle. And Dan Cardelli from Dwayne Street Condominium. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. And Paul Joya did sneak in, so he's in the back after I introduced everybody else. So there's Paul, our general manager. Um, we're going to take a break around 7 o'clock. Um, Michael has asked that we try to hold the questions for the sections that he particularly talks about. So when the question time comes up, he'll go. Otherwise, it kind of gets a little bit out of control. Um, and then we're going to try to wrap it up right around 8 o'clock, uh, which is our scheduled time to be out of here. So again, I'd like to thank you all for being here. And I want to introduce our, our two uh, speakers tonight. And first, I'll start with Mary Siegel. Uh, she's been in the business for over 20 years. Uh, with a variety of different uh, associations, and uh, she has a PCAM designation, which is the highest designation uh, that she can hold through CAI. She served on a lot of CAI committees. She's written articles for Common Ground magazine, and, and um, uh, we're lucky to have her. So, thank you, Mary. And 
Michael, uh, Michael Krybeck is a partner at Colbert's Schifrin Nesbitt, or KSN as most of you probably know it. Uh, he has uh, represented currently over 4,000, or the firm is currently representing over 4,000 different associations. So he's got a wide uh, breadth of experience in condominiums, townhouses, and homeowners association. And he does commit his free time, even though he's got two little ones at home, a year old and a three year old, to education. And I, uh, I absolutely respect that, and so does all of us at ACM. So he's also an active member of CAI and ACTHA, and he's uh, licensed to practice law in Illinois and Wisconsin. And uh, he has brought some uh, literature for us to take at the, uh, at the end of the session tonight, so please help yourself with that. And with that, again, I thank you all, and I'm going to turn it over to Michael. Okay, can everybody hear me okay if I speak at that level? Yeah. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank uh, the team at ACM, Carl, um, for inviting me to come out and speak tonight. Um, I'm going to do my best not to um, hog the entire show for Mary, um, but I've, I've given this, this seminar now, I want to say, six or seven times. Uh, and last week, Mary came and saw us put it on in Naperville. Um, and, and KSN is doing a free uh, seminar in Naperville each month, uh, and if you have an interest in that, each month will be a different topic. See me and I'll make sure that you get information on that. Um, it's topical based on the time of year. Uh, but th this actual, this topic of tonight was what we talked about last week. So I kind of got an opportunity to, uh, to see how it played, not to just lawyers, because I've given it to a number of lawyers also. So as Tom said, uh, my name is Michael Krybeck. I'm a partner with KSN. Um, when you represent as many associations as we do, I get the honor and sometimes the, uh, the tough role of facing a lot of the difficult questions that go with uh, what's going on in the state of, of the industry. Um, tonight's topic is, uh, and based on the turnout, it's quite obvious that people have their eye on what's going on with, with uh, community associations. Um, and uh, I give you uh, credit for, for noticing that and showing up and becoming educated board members. A majority of people here are board members. Um, can you give me by a show of hands how many people here live in condominium associations? Okay, so the vast majority of people here are in condos. How about townhomes or HOAs? Okay, and I don't want to embarrass anyone, but how many people just don't know? <laughs> okay, okay. Well, um, because there is an important distinction um, as to what type of association you live in because there's different statutes now in Illinois that govern um, the different types of associations. So it's very important if you learn nothing else today and you absolutely doze off in the next couple of seconds, um, the takeaway should be find out what uh, type of association you are, find out what statute governs your association. Some people tell me, well, I live in a townhome association. Why I look at their declaration, it's a, it's a townhome style condo. And it actually may look like a townhome, uh, but the reality is it's governed by the Illinois Con, uh, Condominium Property Act. That's a big difference uh, from what you may have been uh, thinking you are governed by uh, if you were in fact a townhome association. Um, I'm gonna briefly go through the first few slides. Uh, just so you know, if you didn't get a handout, there, uh, there are handouts on this back table. If you want to follow along, uh, Tom can, if, if you want to raise your hand, Tom can maybe drop one off to you. The purpose of the handout is there is a spot for you to take notes if you want to. Um, I believe we have enough copies for everybody. If by some chance we don't, um, take my card and shoot me an email. I'm more than happy to email the content to you. Um, the, the easiest way for this seminar to be taught uh, is for it to be somewhat interactive. Uh, there's nothing worse than being talked at for two hours. Uh, but I also do want to get through each of the changes um, and then give you an opportunity to ask questions. Um, that will give us a, an opportunity to wrap up the entire uh, the bullet points for that topic um, and then we go into discussion. I can tell you that there is so much material, uh, so much has changed for associations in, in 2014 and leading into 2015 that we could literally be here all night. Um, there is so much uh, information. Uh, there are so many impactful things that happened in uh, the case law, uh, and we're going to touch on a few of those cases tonight um, towards the end. Um, you know, all i got to do is say the name Palm, and everybody you know, immediately knows what I'm talking about. And if you don't, you've been on a, a really long vacation. Uh, so there, there's that and a couple of other cases that really impacted the way associations <coughs> conduct their business. 
Uh, in addition, there's been a number of changes to the Condo Act, the Common Interest Community Association Act, and a couple of changes that impact all of us, which were changes to the Forcible Entry and Detainer Act and to the Illinois Code of Civil Procedure. Really briefly, uh, just so there's an understanding about the difference between those statutes, to be governed by the common, I'm sorry, the, the Illinois Condominium Property Act, your governing documents, your declaration must make a, an affirmative statement that your association is to be governed by the uh, Condominium Property Act. Um, so if there is any confusion, go and look at your governing documents because your recorded declaration must have that statement somewhere. It's usually in the first couple of pages. Um, and that's how you as a con condominium association determine that statute applies. <coughs> if you are not a condominium association, that's only a few people here, that's not the end of the, uh, the analysis to decide which statute applies to you. Um, the Common Interest Community Association Act is a relatively new, uh, relatively new statute that applies to non-condos that have a budget over, uh, over $100,000 and they must have more than 10 units in the association. So that covers just about everybody else. Prior to that statute becoming law, all of those associations that were non-condos simply look to the Illinois General Not-for-Profit Corporation Act. And it doesn't take long to think about who that statute applies to. Well, that applies to churches, that applies to any organization, it doesn't have to be a residential association uh, that's not, that's, you know, that's, um, that is a not-for-profit corporation. Um, so that statute really did not do a very good job uh, of giving direction to associations, and that's why the Common Interest Community Association Act came to being. Now, because that statute is so new, we see all kinds of changes with that. And we're going to continue to see uh, the legislature try to either fix things that were, were wrong from the beginning or try to get it closer and closer to the Condo Act. Now, the Condo Act has been around since the 1960s, and that is a changing document. We're going to go through some major changes here in a second. Um, that document, um, every year, there's a handful of, of changes that come out um, uh, through the legislature. This year, I had the, the wonderful task of tracking legislation for the law firm. Uh, we have 35 attorneys, and somehow I drew the short straw. And that was almost a full-time job this year, um, keeping track of and, and educating and making sure all of my partners and, and associates were aware of the changes of law um, was a daunting task. Um, only so, so many of them made it through to law and were signed by Governor Quinn. Um, and those are the ones we're going to talk about tonight. One last thing before we get started on the material. Um, you guys, how many people in the room here are managed by ACM? Is everybody in the room managed by ACM? Yeah, there's some people that aren't. Okay. I want to say a few things about that. Uh, the reality is this in the industry right now. The internet, people's access to information, we're all holding on to the majority of people in here probably have a, a Blackberry or, a, or an iPhone. Um, I'm literally, unfortunately, connected to this thing. It's made it so that managers' jobs, board members' jobs, attorneys' jobs are much more difficult these days because everybody wants to play lawyer, everybody wants to play manager, and everybody wants to play board member. And we all have to face the person in your association, the person who, you know, everybody has a a difficult owner, let's put it that way. I'm being recorded, so I'm gonna make sure I don't say uh, anything too bad. Um, and this, I guess, is gonna be on the internet. Uh, we all have those. You could be in a three flat, and you've got a troubled person. And my, my theory is, if you don't recognize that, then you might be that person, okay? And there is, I assure you that there is somebody who is looking for trouble in your association, and I mean, again, yeah, it goes all the way down to three flats in the city. So with that said, you guys now as board members, you need to do what you're doing tonight, educate yourselves. You need to work with your professional manager. There's a reason why these people, like Mary has a PCAM. Okay, these are the people that have, have spent a great deal of time training themselves, and, and they are held to a high standard now with manager licensing. Um, and that's a whole additional topic. But, but you need to rely more and more now on your professional managers, because that's their job. And believe it or not, you might, I, I can tell by looking at you, you're all very intelligent people, but there's no requirement for you to have a certain idea to be a board member, okay? So the, really the reality is you need to lean on your lawyers, your accountants, your managers, and the professionals. 
their opinions are the ones that protect you from liability. Okay? So I know at certain times that, that board members will say, well, we don't want to spend the money or we don't want to pay a management company. We want to be self-managed. But there are a sector of associations that self-management makes sense. You got to use professionals, guys. That's, that's a very important thing to protect yourself from personal exposure. And at the end of the day, none of you want to have your personal assets exposed. Okay. Hopefully I haven't overly scared anybody. Okay, so the first few pages of the slide, I just want to run through. We're just going to you know, kind of hit the tips of the iceberg about what the major changes are, and then we'll go into detail. Um, as it relates to the Illinois Condominium Property Act, so I'm, now I'm speaking specifically about the Condo Act, and then the good news is that's the majority of the people in the room. Um, there is legislation that became law on January 1st that, that addresses expanding the powers of the board. If you guys weren't already power-hungry enough board members, now you have a little bit more. Um, and we'll talk about what that means and how reckless you guys can get with that power. Um, additionally, um, whether or not you guys are aware of this, technology is, everything is happening technologically now and it's growing by leaps and bounds and everything is, you know, is at, at, at your fingertips. And the Condo Act um, is one of those statutes that, as I said, was, was originally enacted in 1968, I believe. And, and the reality is very few things have been done to that statute to bring it up to this day and age. Uh, and a lot of steps were made. And I, and I honestly say, I think there's certain things that are in the, the changes that are great. There's certain things that are confusing as heck and making my job really difficult and managers' jobs really difficult. But it's a really good thing for technology to, to be embraced um, as it relates to communications and notices and as it relates to board, uh, I'm sorry, member input. So if there's certain things like <coughs> voting on elections or voting on any particular items in your declaration that require, uh, that previously required membership input, there's now going to be some uh, provisions that allow for technology to be used. And we'll get into more detail on that. Okay. Um, the other really big thing in the Condo Act is there's been revisions to the insurance provisions. So Section 12 of the Condo Act is a pretty expansive section and goes into great detail about the insurance requirements, obligations, what you can do with deductibles, you know, what's an improvement or a betterment, who's responsible for what. Uh, it's, it's one of the most confused sections um, in the Condo Act because you know, the reality is when there's a water leak and there's, somebody says, well, who's supposed to pay for what, Everybody in the room plays pretty dumb almost immediately because it is the single hardest thing that we do. Uh, lawyers get it wrong, managers get it wrong, board members certainly get it wrong, and I can assure you that non-board members that don't have access to, to attorneys uh, to get opinions are, have absolutely no idea and understanding of it. Um, real briefly, all of the changes that I'm going to talk to you about tonight, um, there's two exceptions about when they begin, okay? The insurance provision does not begin until June 1st of this year. Um, I can speculate about why the legislature pushed it off, um, but I think it's because they wanted to give the insurance industry an opportunity to respond and, and react and prepare themselves for writing policies. Um, and I think, I, mean, I think that is the major reason, and I think it's an opportunity for boards to kind of get a grasp on what the insurance requirements are going to be. Um, so that's a June 1st of 2015 when we get to that discussion. Um, those are the impactful things that, that apply specifically to condo associations. <coughs> Moving along to the Common Interest Community Association Act really briefly. Um, everything I'm going to tell you guys about the technology, there are exact mirror provisions in the Common Interest Community Association Act. So that discussion, the good news is when we have those technology talks, it's going to be for everybody in the room. Um, additionally, there was legislation uh, as it relates to uh, the obligation to turn over a copy of the lease to the board. Um, that's a real simple one. Um, before this legislation uh, went into effect, um, you only looked to the declaration. If the declaration didn't say that they had to supply a copy of the lease, there was no statutory requirement that they do that. Now they have a statutory obligation to turn over a copy of the lease. Okay, real briefly, amendments to uh, to the Illinois Code of Civil Procedure, and then one, um, actually there's a couple here. Uh, one of them that's, that's uh, to the condo, I'm sorry, to the um, Forcible Entry and Detainer Act. This is the association's right to rent clarify. Before this, this, uh, this legislation, legislation 
there was no guidance on when leases could begin, when, when associations got uh, possession of a unit after a forcible entry detainer lawsuit, and how long they could keep the property. Now there's going to be some guidance on when you must do certain things. The courts have clearly decided now, and we'll get into it, they want there to be some guidance on what you guys as, as boards can do once you get possession of a piece of property. The last thing before we talk about the cases briefly is service of process. Whether or not you live in a gated community or you have a doorman or some barrier to entry to your, your unit doors, um, there now is legislation that says you have an obligation to let somebody in. If they're a special process server and they announce themselves, you gotta let them in. Uh, and we'll talk about that in more detail uh, once we get uh, to that point. Okay, so now that's all of the legislation changes, the impactful ones. If I said that was all of them, I'd be lying, uh, but those are the ones that, uh, that impact associations uh, most directly and that you're gonna be hearing about this year. Three cases I wanna, that we're gonna go through and discuss. Uh, the first one is 1010 Lakeshore Association versus Deutsche Bank. Uh, my firm represents 1010 Association, so I have a lot of familiarity with that case. That case we're going to get into, into the details, but what it does is it expands a, a, an association's right after a foreclosure to potentially recover not only post-foreclosure money that's owed, but potentially, under certain circumstances, pre-foreclosure money. Now, we'll, we'll talk about that in detail because it's very important and it's very impactful because that's a scenario where associations are kind of left holding the bag uh, when there's a foreclosure. In this case, opens that door a little bit, allows us to stick our foot in and, and try to uh, recover more money. <coughs> Excuse me. Palm versus 2800. I'm not sure I need to say much more about that. <coughs> in the summary time here, we'll go obviously go into some detail. Um, but that's the single biggest impactful case <coughs> on community associations in the last 20 years. No doubt about it. Um, it turned the association's uh, governance, management, attorneys, it turned everything kind of on its head. Um, the message has kind of softened over time, um, but we will go into what that message is and, and what you guys should be doing and shouldn't be doing. Spanish Court 2. Um, one of my partners, Diane Silverberg, um, argued, uh, we represent Spanish Court 2, and argued in front of the Illinois State Supreme Court on this case successfully. And the proposition, which we will discuss in greater detail in that case, is um, whether or not an association or the payment of assessments by a member is tied to in any way to whether or not the board is upkeeping the common element, okay? Because you would really run into a what comes first, chicken or the egg, if you said, I'm not paying my assessments because you're not sweeping outside my front door. Um, that issue is what was tackled by the Illinois State Supreme Court. And we'll get into that detail. Before I get started, because I'm gonna really dive into this, we've got a lot of material. Um, does anybody have any questions? Okay. As Tom said, and Mary, if you want to interject at any point in time, stand up and shout your name. Uh, as, as Tom said, the way I think this is going to work easiest, best, is I'm going to go through a, a change and I'm going to go through the discussion points on it. I'm not reading what this says. You guys, I'm assuming all of you can read. Um, I'm going to tell you what I think the most impactful things are. Um, and then I'm going to open it up to questions on that particular change. Okay. And you know we can play a game of stump the lawyer if you guys want to. Um, what I will say about that is this is new law for me too. Okay. The reality is we, you know, as the legal field, are similarly. While I know what the statute says, that's what lawyers do is we interpret what statutes say. I mean, there wouldn't I wouldn't have a job if everything was black and white. So I can give you what my legal opinion is on things and where I think the courts are going to fall, but there's no case law yet. So. A lot of this is us prognosticating what we think is going to happen, um, but you know, a lot of the bullet points are specifics right out of the different statutes. Okay, the first topic we're going to get into is from the Condo Act, and it's related, so, so it's specific to the Condo Act. It's expansion of the, the power of the board. So effective on January 1st, so a few weeks ago, um, there's an expansion of, uh, of, of rights for the board. And what that means and what was expanded is if you have a declaration that limits or forces the board to take the next step and ask the membership their, their permission to do something. 
Um, those provisions in the governing documents are now void. That's very important from a litigation standpoint. The single biggest or most impactful it, uh, example I can give on that is as it relates to uh, the right to sue the developer. This is the one that comes up all the time. The developer did uh, somewhat of a shoddy job, but the developer also was the person who hired a lawyer to draft the declaration. Guess what? The declaration is certainly going to favor the developer um, or declarant, same person in this instance. And what you're going to see is they're going to put provisions in place that limit a board's right to go after them. Um, they're going to put a provision in the declaration that says that you need, two th an example, two-thirds of the membership of the association to vote in favor of any lawsuit against the declarant or the, uh, or the developer. That is a hurdle or a roadblock that was created. I don't blame a, I don't blame a developer for doing that, uh, but what it did is it made it very difficult for associations after turnover, especially if the declarant or developer still had lots, for them to pursue causes of action for, for construction defects. So um, what the legislation now says is that any provision that requires a vote of the owners for the board to act is now null and void. Now, if what you, my last sentence, if you just heard it, it probably should maybe ring a bell with some of you, because there's a lot of provisions in declarations that require membership approval. <clears throat> Spending of money, um, special, sometimes special assessments in certain circumstances. What's important to understand is this isn't going in place or voiding Condo Act provisions, it's voiding the de declaration provisions. So if the Condo Act already says to amend the declaration you need two thirds, which section 27 of the Condo Act says you need uh, for non-discretionary amendments, that doesn't, we're not, this legislation doesn't step in place of the Condo Act, it simply steps in place of provisions in your declaration that create this hurdle or roadblock to litigate. Um, and not only to litigate, but for the board to make decisions. So I foresee there being uh, litigation at some point in time over this provision because it's not altogether that clear how wide sweeping it is. If there is something in a declaration that requires uh, membership votes, um, I, uh, then it's not related to litigation. I foresee that being a, a, a litigatable issue because it's not very clear in the statute. My example, though, for the litigation is the one that I can give the most practical example for. Uh, there is a provision um, that allows, if you guys as an ownership want that provision to stay, it can be retained by a vote of 75% of the unit owners can vote to retain that, that provision that requires, you know, it, what it does is it eliminates the, the rogue board, the runaway board for making decisions without ownership approval. 75% is a high threshold, though. So to get 75% of your ownership to ask for that, that's a, that's a, a lot of uh, participation, which we all probably are aware is sometimes difficult. Does anybody have any questions about that particular change? Yes, ma'am. Did I understand correctly they can spend money without having, like our bylaws state our board cannot spend more than $2,500 on, unless it's approved by two-thirds of the homeowners. That's a perfect example. So now, wonderful example. This is the non-litigation example. $2,500 is certainly not going to cause an issue with uh, any of the Condo Act provisions regarding changing of budgets um, that would require voting of the, the members. Mm -hmm. My response to you is that provision now is null and void. Okay, now if they did it last December or August, they spent $100,000 without homeowner approval. Okay, well that, this provision was not in place at the time. So they can't do that, literally, but now they can. Correct. They would have needed ownership approval prior to January 1st, okay. but as of January 1st, the provision that requires, that, that's the great example where it sets a, a low threshold. 20, anything over $2,500, come on guys, that's, it's almost impossible to do business. So you've now made it almost an impossibility for the board to conduct any business. You've made it impossible for the management company to do anything. But if it's in the buy, if it's in the budget, that's already approved by the homeowners. Okay, so it's so outside of budgeted the budget for items. Yes. 
Okay. The, the plain language of the statute says that any requirement, any provision in the declaration or the bylaws, which is a usually an exhibit to the declaration, that's null and void. And architectural things that they can do, like say they want to decide now half the homeowners bought windows, now the board wants new windows, so now all of a sudden we're all paying for new windows? It really depends on, I mean, yeah, certainly I mean, I'll see what you Would that fall into is. that category? If there is an explicit provision in the declaration that mm -hmm. requires a vote of the owners, I, I guess I, I don't understand your question as far as the windows, <coughs> right. but if, if there's a provision that says that to replace the windows in all of the units, you would need a vote of two-thirds of the owners to do so, mm -hmm. arguably, if you don't run into issues with the, the spending, because there's, remember, there's still spending restrictions in the condo act. You can't just run out and just start writing checks. You oh, still no, have an obligation. Four hundred thousand dollars. What I'm telling you is there's still obligations though to meet that they were supposed to do. Correct. That may very well be true. Okay. And we can talk about it separately mm -hmm. if you want to. Yeah. Any other questions, sir? Eric? Yeah. Yeah. I got a question. If so, so the seventy-five percent threshold. <clears throat> let's say we, we want to enact. It's not currently in place, but we want to enact something that says you have to get a sixty percent vote of the membership, and it goes to the membership, and 75% of the membership approve that, well, if you, can that then I, be enforceable? I think I understand what you're saying. If you want to create a hurdle, and create a roadblock, you're going to need to amend your declaration, right. and you're gonna to need to jump, if you're, a lot of times it says two thirds, you now have created a higher threshold necessary. You're gonna to need to go up to 75%, because you need 75% of your owners to survive it being voided. No, but okay, my question is to to create one, we need a seventy-five percent. You need an amendment to your declaration. This is only existing hurdles that okay. are being voided. If you want to create a hurdle, Correct. you need to amend your declaration. Right. And it wouldn't be the, the number that you would need to get a vote of the membership would be seventy-five percent. Correct. But we could put a hurdle in that was less <coughs> than seventy-five percent. Oh, absolutely. For going forward. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. That's a clarification. Yep. Good question. Thanks. Paul. Um, how does this affect uh, caps on assessment increases? Caps on assessment increases it's require up to third, over it's, a third over It's not going to because that language actually appears in the Condo Act. So that's what I said. That, and that's a good question. <clears throat> the, the issue. Go ahead. I'm sorry. In one, it may only be 15% when the Condo Act is 25. The Condo Act is 15. So, so yes, yeah, so, so backwards, you have to follow in that instance what the Condo Act says, okay? Because it's your, your provision in the um, declaration has been voided, okay? So you've now eliminated, if there's a spending cap and it says some higher threshold than what the, declar or than what the Condo Act says, we're falling back to the Condo Act. Um, this do does nothing to what the other hurdles or restrictions are in the Condo Act. It just simply, it, in my example, your, your $2,500 low number is another really good example. This was intended to try to take the handcuffs off of issues with uh, construction defect cases. We have so many of these cases where we have associations come to us, boards of directors will come to us and say, we want to sue the developer, the whole place is collapsing in on itself, but we've got this provision. And you know what? It's a really tough pill to swallow, or it was prior to January 1st, when we had to say, can you get the votes necessary? Or, you know, I'll get to this also. I, I actually, uh, there's another thing here that I forgot to mention. This also talks about any requirements regarding uh, arbitration or mediation. So if a developer tries to put some kind of uh, requirement that, that a case be arbitrated or that it be mediated, those provisions are also uh, void. That's why I'm so sure of what the purpose of the legislation was, is because they're trying to remove the board, you guys, trying to stop hurdles being put up to get you, to keep you from court. If you want to go to court and you want, if you have a valid cause of action, why in God's name do you have to go to a mediator as opposed to going to the Daily Center? Um, you have those rights. Um, and that's what, that's what the purpose of the legislation, in my opinion, was. Anybody else real quick? One more fast question. Okay. The, the part here where it says on the governing documents, uh, the declarant and the developer are person not can the association take a homeowner without any prior notices or anything to court? Yeah. Like for non-payment of uh, violations. 
Correct. Well, most, most of the times these provisions we see are very specific as to who it is that, that the restriction is. Mm -hmm. So there's no, this has nothing to do with you as an association, your right to take a, a unit owner to court as for non-payment assessments, for having too red of a door or too fat of a dog, whatever your rules might be. <laughs> you still have that same right, okay? Um, this doesn't ha you have any impact on that. Oh, okay. Okay. So they can just go through, but they have to follow proper channels to do that. Correct. Whatever. Still, they have to follow the old channels that they sure. have to do. Sure. For instance, according to the bylaws. you know, unpaid assessments. You still have a statutory obligation to send a 30-day notice. It doesn't right. change the statutory requirements. The hurdles that we as lawyers have to jump over to get to court. There's still certain things we have to do. Um, so yeah, there's still a process in place. All right. Um, and you may very well each have your own policy about what you guys. You know, does management send a letter first before you send it to the lawyer? Um, you still follow your own internal policies. Okay. Yes, sir. Last one. Are you uh, right, man? Um, associations um, look at their declaration and make, and redoing it in conjunction with these you know, changes, or the, the reality is that's a that's a good question, and we'll touch. Uh, let me touch on that real quickly. But overall, because we're going to talk about the whole thing, the reality is this: it costs a lot of money to redo your governing documents. My firm quotes somewhere between twenty five hundred and thirty five hundred dollars, depending upon whose door you knock on. I guess um, my door is twenty five hundred. Uh, the reality is that's a lot of money and you also have to get the votes. If you're simply trying to bring it up to the state of the law, that only requires a vote of the board. So make sure you understand that. If you're simply trying to either correct an error, so if there's like a number transposed, or you're trying to make it comply with the current state of the law, the board can do that. You have the legal right to do that as a board. If you're trying to make any uh, substantive change, like now you want to cap leasing, or you, you, know, you want to say something about pets. Um, that's, a, that's a membership vote issue. So not only do you pay the money, but you also need to get the votes. So to answer your question, yes, the more changes, the more things that I stand up here and talk about, the more reasons why your documents are flawed. Okay, if every year there's changes like there were this year, every year there are changes. This year there was a lot of them. Uh, your documents are becoming bigger and bigger lies, right? I mean, you're handing them out at a closing, and you're saying, here's a, here's a copy of a declaration, please follow it. But if they do any reading, they're going to realize half of it's inaccurate, and half of it doesn't apply because it's all about the declarant who was long gone 30 years ago. So to answer your question, yeah, if, if, if the board is mindful and wanting to give accurate information to their owners, yeah, they should amend the governing documents. No, by no means is there a requirement. There's nobody's ever you know, weighed in and no court's ever said, you got to get these documents cleaned up because they're full of lies. Uh, that's just not, that's not what it says. Good question, though. Okay, let's move into <clears throat> technology. Okay, the first impactful change as it relates to technology has to do with notices and communications. Okay, this is you guys sending out notices of meetings. This is you guys having you know, communications with an owner. Um, however they may be, you want to tell them, you want to send them a letter from me, and what I call nasty grams, and, it, and telling somebody their dog's too fat. Um, those types of communications um, <coughs> that, that maybe needed to have some specific notice requirements prior, pursuant to the Condo Act or the governing documents, there's now mechanisms in place that allow for uh, notices to be done electronically by technology. And what they, they went out of their way to, to not limit it to email because they must, maybe there's going to be some new technology that we don't know about, but they wanted to call it techno technological means. Here's the issue, okay? I get a lot of phone calls, probably two or three a week, and the person says, well, I heard about this new legislation, and we want to start using it tomorrow. Can we send out notices? The answer is no, okay? There's very specific things that have to be done before you can avail yourself um, of, of the right to do it. Most notably, you have to adopt rules, okay? And the, and the statute actually sets forth pretty specific requirements about what, it, it's not brain surgery, what it has to say, and we prepare, I probably prepare four or five of them a week now, um, but you have to prepare and actually affirmatively vote on in an open meeting by the board to adopt uh, uh, notice and communication rules, okay? That's step one. Step two, is your members have to opt in, okay? So when you, when, I, when you ask me to draft you one, I'm gonna send you a couple things. I'm gonna send you the rule, I'm gonna send you the resolution of adopting it, and I'm gonna send you an opt-in form. And you now have the wonderful opportunity to try to go out and get people to sign it. 
because the statute does not require that everybody do it. Okay? They have to affirmatively accept the idea of doing it. And I can assure you, the little old guy in you know, the top unit who doesn't have a phone or doesn't have any te technology isn't going to opt in. That's going to be a problem for people like Mary because they're the, one of the burdens on, on management is going to be they have to track these two different classes of people. Okay? Now, as time goes on, people are going to sign off. I would certainly rather get a notice by this than get a notice you know, waiting out by my mailbox and checking the mail. Um, so that's the direction things are going. Um, but if somebody doesn't affirmatively opt in, we cannot strong arm them. They have to be able to receive it uh, the way they always did by mail. Guess what, though? It's going to save time, money. You're not going to kill trees with paper, no stamps. Uh, it really is going to make things easier. Uh, the opt-in form that we have says that it's their, uh, the, the member's obligation to update the association when their address changes. We put the burden on the member, okay? If they, if they have a bad email address and they give us a bad email address, that's their problem, not ours, right? They're the ones who are affirmatively opting in. Additionally, the question was raised about, okay, under the Condo Act, under Section uh, 19, you have a right to records. You have a right to somebody, whether or not you know this, anybody in your association can get your name, your address, and your weighted vote. That is, whether or not you like it, everybody has a right to it. Um, I, don't, I don't personally like it because it results in a lot of solicitations. Um, but now, you're going to have the opportunity to have your email address made available to people. Um, and part of our opt-in form gives you the option of deciding, do you want them to have your email address? Do you want them only to have your email address and not your mailing address? You just need to be able to make available um, your information to these people under Section 19 requests. Um, you know, the, the question was posed the other night, <coughs> excuse me, the question was posed the other night when I did the seminar, well, what happens when management inputs the email address wrong and that results in no notice? Wonderful question. See you in court, <laughs> right? I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, it's probably the board's mistake, it's probably management's mistake, but that's just another one of the little nuances that we're gonna be dealing with with technology. They fill out a form and they have terrible handwriting and now you're stuck trying to decide what email address to send it to, it's an issue. Technology isn't perfect, it's somewhat flawed. Emails bounce back, whose responsibility is it to do something about that? Guess what, that's why there's lawyers, I guess, so we'll be dealing with that in court. Um, any questions as a result to the communications and notices? Yes, ma'am. When you say they have to opt in, what we did was we emailed them and said, please email us back with permission. Yeah, but the, okay, so. It doesn't have to be a signature is my question. It does not have to be a signature. And that's interest, another interesting thing that comes out of the next one we're going into is technology is moving towards electronic signatures. So that's another thing that's coming. Um, no, I, that, is, that isn't a valid opt-in. They have to affirmatively accept it. I certainly would keep that email in my file. Because then you have the email address it's coming from, too, so you're sure you have the right email address. I think that's a wonderful way to ensure that you have a valid email address. Um, in fact, I had not thought of that, but that's a good idea. Uh, but So if you want to send the opt-in form and they can you know, decide what, because our form does require additional information. You know, I want to know what, and, and I want to have management have a good record of what information you're making available to people. Um, because unfortunately, people want to get in your business. They want to get the records and they want to send you a, a candidacy form because I'm the best person to run for the board. That's going on. Um, any other questions? So if you opt out, is there any way of not getting Mary Jane to get my in-person information? <coughs> no, your name, your address, and your weighted vote is they're absolutely entitled to it. We fight all day long about phone numbers. Everybody wants to get people's phone numbers. That, the statute doesn't say phone numbers at this point. Um, and we go round and round about it because you know, what I'm fighting about now is there's a board member who wants to get all the phone numbers. Well, board members have a little bit higher access to information. But my cautionary tale is if they're going to use those phone numbers, it better be for board, and for, uh, board purposes. They better not be out there doing something with that information inappropriately. Um, anyway, any other questions? Sir? Can you, can you remind me, when, um, you said the board has to uh, uh, make an amendment, probably to the rules, um, to enact electronic communication? There needs to be a, a, a rule put in place. Whether it's an amendment to the whole set of rules or it's simply a rule and then adopted by a resolution, 
That's um, and that's kind of my question. When that happens, do you have to send out the full, uh, full rules and regulations out no. with this amendment? Or do you have to the rules. Out? So it's a one page. It's actually, we, ours is, is two points. There's literally a, a one and a two. Yeah. So it's a resolution. And the, you would send out the copy of the resolution, the rule, and the opt-in form. And you'd say on such and such date, and you'd mail it out not less than 10, not more than 30. And right. say on this date, we're going to be adopting the attached resolution. If you would like to participate, please check the box, that kind of thing. Um, okay, moving on, because we're going to be taking a break here in about 15 minutes. Um, I want to get through the condo stuff for sure. Okay, um, the next one, really a hot topic. We probably spent a huge amount of time on this the other night. Voting and, and other um, issues that you can handle uh, by the, there's a requirement of the members to contribute to, to give a decision uh, and to give input. That now, if the rules are adopted appropriate, appropriately, can be done by electronic means. Boy, that makes my head hurt a little bit because I go to so many board meetings and, and elections where mostly elections. And they're contentious, right? I mean, you guys had to, you guys aren't politicians, but you somewhat had to stump to get your jobs in some cases. Uh, some of you, maybe it wasn't so hard and nobody wants the job. It is high paying, of course. Uh, but you'd be surprised. I, the meetings I go to, the only reason why they call the lawyer out to the annual election is because there's a big old fist fight getting ready to happen. So I, those are not the places, in my opinion, that you want to be doing electronic voting. Because if you thought there was allegations of voter fraud before, imagine all the people who are going to come out of the woodwork and claim that there is fraud in the way that the vote took, you know, the electronic vote took place. There are third-party companies, and I'm not sure if Carl's been confronted by them yet, that are trying to assist management companies in the software and in the, in the process of doing the votes for them. If I'm a management company, I don't want to be the one running that because now you've interjected yourself into the process. I, you know, I really would want there to be some third party that is overseeing the collection and the whole process. Otherwise, you became a witness in the trial, really, um, if you're the one running it as a management standpoint. Um, but what that does, though, is it does allow a mechanism. Now, again, you have to adopt the rules. First and foremost, if you don't adopt any rules and you come to me, and you say, hey, the, the election's next week and you want to do it by email. No, you got within at least 120 days prior to the election, you'd have to adopt your rules. Those rules, if you do in fact, the association does adopt electronic means elections, that is not an opt-in or opt-out, it's mandatory, with one caveat. If you choose to show up to the election, you can vote in person, okay? So you can, if you, if you Pick the wrong button and you voted for the wrong person and you want to go back and change your mind or somebody upset you, you can go to the meeting and you can change your vote. Um, if you adopt those rules, it does have an impact on proxies. Um, you know, and Mary and I had a discussion and one of my competitors says that it eliminates proxies. I believe that after reviewing it, it does eliminate proxies only for elections. Okay, so if it's something else, there's another uh, topic that um, required a member vote and you chose to do it electronically, there is still a provision in this statute that allows you to still have proxies for non-election member votes, okay? Now, this is gonna be the set of rules that you ask your lawyer to do that he starts crying on the other end of the phone <laughs> because imagine all of the different contingencies, secret, you know, dealing with secret ballots, dealing with the deadlines, all of these different little factors have to be taken into account in your rules or you're, you're begging to go to court because your, your election is going to be challenged. Um, so you're going to have to have very complete rules um, to, to ensure that you don't have any loopholes in the process. Um, that I want to make sure it's understood that what I just said about the, the last two sections equally apply to the Common Interest Community Association Act, okay? Um, Including the voting? The voting also. There's, there's a provision. So all of the provisions as it relates to notice, communication, and voting, there are mere provisions in the Common Interest Community Association Act. There's also language in this statute, which I'll be the first one to admit to you. Um, I haven't decided whether or not we think it's constitutional, but it does eliminate the requirement for, pro uh, for notarization. <clears throat> well, a couple of us in my office bang our heads together and say, well, 
I don't know that that's a constitutional elimination of the requirement for notarization. Some declarations require that you vote and acknowledge. And in the legal field, acknowledgement means that it is notarized. So my take on that is if there's a declaration requirement that you collect the member votes and it be acknowledged, we no longer will be saying that person has to not only vote a certain way, but they also have to acknowledge and or know, have it notarized. Um, so that's another thing, is that the, the, the way of notarization is going away with technology, the idea of notarization. <clears throat> and there's also discussion in, the, in this statute about electronic signatures. So my perspective on the electronic signatures is standby. I think it was poorly drafted. I think that you're going to hear more about it in the next year or two in the legislation because it's not altogether that clear to the legal field um, how you are going to uh, effectively eliminate the need for signatures and how you're going to ever know somebody's electronic signature is a valid signature. Um, so my, from my perspective, that's a to be continued topic. Um, does anybody have any questions about that? Yes, ma'am. Does this apply to board members voting? No, it does not apply. It, it is specifically for votes of members, so membership votes. Um, likewise, and this I get to ask this question a lot, board votes cannot be done by proxy ever. Um, and that's in the common interest, uh, that's in the General Not for Profit Corporation Act. Board members must be live. That doesn't mean they have to be alive in the room. <laughs> Sometimes they're not. They can be on the phone, but they can't be by email. So they can't they have to be real time and live. I um, thought I'd use that opportunity to throw those points in because that's a big topic. Sir? These are all new Illinois statutes in Correct. 2014. Are any of these national or are they all brand new written and only Illinois has them? They're, so they are brand new written. I can tell you a lot of what we do, and we're going to talk about the Ombudsperson uh, Act at the end of the night tonight. We follow, whether or not you're aware of this, we track pretty closely with Florida. Um, so a lot of what we see, we're kind of the tail. Uh, they're the dog. Um, they, things happen in Florida, and then a couple of years later, they get here. Um, I'm not aware of the specific language being in anybody else's condo act. Um, so to answer your question directly, this is purely Illinois law. Um, every one of these things is purely Illinois law. There is no federal um, statutes as it relates to condos, uh, the governance of condos. Each state has their own. Um, there are certain things like the, um, the FCC uh, over air uh, receptive devices act. Um, so there's certain different things like the, the, the flag code that are federal that apply to associations. <laughs> Um, but these are specific to uh, Illinois. Yes, ma'am. Okay, if you don't opt into getting a email paperwork and they decide to do voting via computer, mm -hmm. how does that work for people that don't work with computers? It's going to seniors? have to be done through management is going to have to um, either have a, a, a portal, a way for you to access, excuse me, secure voting. Mm -hmm. Or my suggestion is avail yourself of the right to show up. Um, people who don't want to use technology, um, I, there, I see nothing in here that prohibits them from coming to the election and casting their vote. Can the they do the proxies? Like if you have a senior that won't, never comes to the meeting. To answer your question, and it's not going to be an answer you like, it's what's in your rules too. I mean, you guys, you, you okay. adopt the rules as it relates to your election. There's going to be gray areas when you start trying to eliminate people's access to voting. That's the quickest way to a courthouse is to say you successfully eliminated all of my ability to vote. Um, that's the very quick way to. There's a lot of lawyers out there that would love to mitigate that. Okay. So you got to be careful about the rules. Yes, sir. I'm a little confused. Are proxies in or out? Proxies are, as we sit here right now with no rules in place, proxies are in. You can eliminate proxies. You always could. You always had the right on 120 days to adopt, a, uh, adopt election rules eliminating proxies. You always had that right. Very similarly to secret balloting. You always have the right on 120 days prior to the election to adopt rules as it relates to almost all aspects of an election. Um, so the only thing that's different here is that... Um, the, the proxy issue is being addressed by way of, of technology. 
Um, and this particular rule appears, this particular statute appears to say, if you adopt the technology, you can't, you could not collect the technological vote of all the people for the election. Okay, because that would be a proxy, and if you're doing it by technology, that eliminates the technology, the use of technology eliminates the right to proxies in board elections. Okay, that prohibits you from going to the computer and casting ballots for everybody. And essentially, I guess for lack of a better term, you could be rigging the election um, because you have all those people's proxies. Make sense? Okay. Yes, sir. So you mean in this case, members being unit only? Correct. Correct. Okay, um, let's really quickly before the break, um, I just want to, because I've already told you that all of the technology stuff that I just went through applies to both. There's one other impactful um, change, and it's really brief, for common interest community associations only, and it relates to the requirement that a, um, an owner turn over a copy of a lease to the association. For the longest time, um, the only teeth or the only requirement that an owner had in a townhome style uh, association or an HOA to turn over a lease to the board was if in fact it was in the declaration. Okay, if the declaration was silent, you had no statutory backup. The Conduit Act has that provision. The Conduit Act says you got an ob a statutory obligation to turn over a copy of the lease. Um, what happened here now is they decided to make a mere uh, provision that requires um, that unit owners turn over a copy. It's very important to know who's in these units, okay? Uh, from an insurance standpoint, from a number of different standpoints, from a, you know, from a liability, you wanna know who's in these units. Um, so that provision is now there. Does anybody have um, any questions about that? Is there a time frame determined by after You know, I don't see that it does. I think it says, no, it does say, one second. It says within occupancy of 10 days after the lease is signed. So they, have, they do actually have a deadline. Good question. Is it already in the Illinois Condo Property Act that they yes. copy leases? Yes. And that the purpose was to kind of mirror, um, very slowly it's happening, but they're trying to mirror more and more in the Common Interest Community Association, Association Act what the Condo Act says on a number of topics. Sir? Is there um, maybe a recommended best practice for how to actually police that? I mean. A resident or a board member suspects this unit being leased, and so we write them maybe a notice that says we expect the lease. How? Well, you know, if you have to decide for a fact that something's being leased or not. If you determine something to be finable, if you decide that okay, if you have an obligation and there's a make an arbitrary number, twenty-five dollar uh, fine if you fail to turn over a copy of the lease, and you and you submit, let's say you have a, a, a violation. Uh, somebody says, I believe there's a tenant in there, yeah. and you send a notice of violation. Um, and you, you get the person the right to a hearing to come in and dispel the fact. And, and it happens quite often, we deal with it, where they say, well, that's my sister's second cousin, and they're gonna park their three cars here too. Well, okay, the association, you guys as a board have a lot of discretion <coughs> to decide to call BS, right? To decide, you know what, that's a lease. You know, in, in reality, or if somebody says, well, I don't have a written lease. Okay, well, there's such a thing as an oral contract, and that's still a lease, okay? So if somebody is, is living there, whether or not they're paying rent from a legal standpoint, that's a lease, okay? If they don't have a right under the governing documents to, to be there, um, depending upon what your leasing restrictions might say, um, there's issues there. Um, and that's, that's for the board to decide how, how severe and how hard they want to enforce those provisions. Anything else? Effective Last one. one, one. What's that? Is it effective January 1st? That is effective January 1st as we sit here. Okay, let's get started. And I assure you, while most of this topic, if not all of the topic I'm handling, Mary is a very good manager and a very intelligent person. So I don't, I don't mean to uh, <laughs> monopolize all of the time. Uh, so, okay, we're going to move into a couple of the changes um, that are outside of the two statutes, the Condo Act and the Common Interest Community Association Act, that, that impact all of the associations, okay? Um, the first one is as it relates to the Forcible Entry and Detainer Act. That is the lovely statute that allows a 
associations in Illinois um, the right to not only get a money judgment for non-paid assessments, but the right to take possession of a person's unit. Now, once in a while I'll test how crazy this statute really is, and I'll, I'll bring it up to somebody who doesn't know about you know, the area of law I practice, or I'm originally from Wisconsin, so I'll bring it up to my, my parents I've done it. And it absolutely floors people that in Illinois, we're the only state out of all 50 states that has a statute like this. Um, Here's a little bit of a fact pattern, okay? You are a person who buys for cash a $300,000 condo, and you stop paying your assessments for whatever reason, for a couple months. Something gets lost in the mail, or you are a forgetful person, and you stop paying attention to the notices that come in the mail, and next thing you know, six to eight to nine months down the road, the sheriff is pounding on your door, or has pounded his way through your door, um, is changing your locks, and him and his friends uh, and coworkers are removing all of your personal belongings and putting them out in the street. That almost sounds like fiction, doesn't it? But that's what we have in Illinois. Um, in Illinois, we are the only state that allows you to throw somebody's worldly belongings out in the street. And they can own the place free and clear without a mortgage because they don't pay their assessments. Okay. So with that as the backdrop, because that blows my mind every time I say that, that we can do that, um, and nobody ever believes me, um, there are some limitations um, to uh, what we can and cannot do. As most of you are familiar, there is the whole discussion about, well, we have a right to six months of unpaid assessments um, if, in fact, there is a foreclosure um, action filed. And there is debate. One of, the, one of the things I could have been talking to you about tonight was... Um, Senate Bill 2664 uh, was going to expand that to nine months. Okay, it was going to go from six months that allowed you to get six months of assessments and any special assessments, attorney's fees, or any other fees that are accrued during that six month window if you file a claim, which the courts and in, in the, the geniuses down, uh, downtown have told us means you have to actually file the lawsuit. It's not just mailing out a 30 day notice. Uh, the legal industry, there's still some question, and some firms are just saying it's the 30-day notice being mailed. Well, there is case law now that says that you actually have to file the lawsuit to protect or to perfect your right to the six months and all of the other um, fees and expenses that are incurred during that six-month window that predates the uh, foreclosure. Um, that's the big one. And, and that Senate bill um, was mandatorily vetoed by Governor Quinn um, and we were all paying attention to that because what he changed it to in his veto, he amended it to say it, essentially the association was going to get everything um, that predated. It was a windfall to the association that everything predating the, the foreclosure was recoverable by associations. And you know, me, I, that was the best news I had heard in a while. Um, and boards, too, because you guys, you know, the, the dirty, the four-letter words in the industry are foreclosure and bankruptcy. Those are the words that... You cringe at, I cringe at, because those are the times that I can't make you happy. Managers can't give you an answer that you're going to like when there's a foreclosure or bankruptcy. And even worse, there's both in the same case, um, where we get boxed out almost entirely. Well, um, one of the last things that happened as, um, in, in the veto session um, was that essentially the legislature shot down his amended, Governor Quinn's mandatory veto, and we're just back to what it always was. Six months you got to file the forcible case to, to protect, perfect your right to that six months, and then what is uh, incurred during that six-month period is what you're entitled to. Um, so that's where things stayed. What did change, though, is, is what we have in, in this piece of legislation, is the courts have now given us some direction uh, and some information as it relates to what can we do with an order of possession um, once we have it. Okay, so we have what we go to court and we get an order of possession, we get a money judgment. Whether or not you're aware of this, what happens when, when I or another attorney goes to court and they give you your order of possession, you know, say you get a certain amount of money, you get a certain amount of attorney's fees, you get a certain stay date, and after that stay date is when you can place the order of possession with the sheriff, the sheriff puts it on a schedule, they go out and they evict. That's the process. Um, the stay date. Uh, the period, it's based on the time of year. They don't evict people during the holidays. They're very uh, wonderful people. They don't want to throw you out um, during the holidays. Um, and by county. 
Uh, some counties have shorter stay periods. Usually it's somewhere between 45 and 60 days. Um, so what this piece of legislation says, though, that you as a, an association, if you're going to play landlord, which, by the way, I recommend you do because this is one of the big ways you can recover your money. Um, and, and we're the, again, we're the only state that allows us to recover your unpaid assessments by way of an order of possession. Um, that you have up to eight months from the expiration of the state aid. So remember, not only you get your judgment, you get your order of possession. At the end of the state aid, you have eight months from the expiration of the state aid to have a lease commence. Okay, now eight months from the end of the state period sounds like a short amount, of, or sounds like a lot of time. But you have to keep in mind, any of you who have had the, the pleasure or horrible displeasure of walking into a unit that you got possession of and seeing that they took all the copper wiring, there's no more furnace. Somebody said that to me this morning. They took the furnace. Okay, how do you deal with that? You gotta, well, you gotta put a new furnace in. Um, those, are the, those are the situations that you have to deal with during that eight month period. Not only do you have to make it a livable unit and incur the cost, you also have to find a suitable tenant. So eight months is not that much time. You, you are now in a bit of a race. Um, once you get your order of possession in the end of the state period, you actually get possession. Once you walk through that door, you have eight months to turn that place around, get it all fixed up, get it rented out, a meaningful rent, rental situation. And it must commence. It's not just find the right tenant, it's begin the lease. This is a judge's way, um, you know, from the attorneys talk about why, what is, why are they doing this? It's to keep associations from getting orders of possession and doing nothing with it. And sitting on that unit, not using the right to, to actually benefit from it. You displace somebody and you're not even, you're not even attempting to, to use that as an asset to bring in money. So if you don't do this, your order of possession is going to be stale and that person is going to most likely be given the possession of the unit back once they make a demand. Additionally, uh, the court went on to say that the term of the lease may not exceed 13 months from the date of the commencement of the lease. Okay, that's impactful because we have scenarios where, and we'll get into a, a, an example here in a second, where the person who's on title goes to parts unknown. <clears throat> There's not a foreclosure yet or the foreclosure hasn't, hasn't completed and you have an order of possession. I have associations that have had tenants in units for four or five years, okay? And they continue to collect the money and they say, the, the, the title holders never come back, never ask for possession. We just are holding the money, segregating it in a separate account, which is what legally you should be doing. Every month, obviously they still owe assessments, so you draw it down on the assessments. If you're managing the property, you can pay the management fee out of that. If you're putting in a new furnace, you can take the money out of that for the furnace fee. Um, so you still have that piggy bank of money that you're drawing down, but that's not your money. That's the unit owner's money. If they ever come back, if and when they do, they'll be entitled to possession and whatever money that you've collected on their behalf. So the court does go on to say, or the legislature does go on to say, that you can go back to court and get an additional 13 months and probably more than that. What the court is trying to do here is to stop the example I just gave, where you just hold on to that property in perpetuity. <coughs> and you just keep leasing it and keep leasing it. Because at some point in time, if you're made whole and you go into court and you say, judge so-and-so, you know, we have an order of possession, we've got a tenant in there, we've been made whole, um, and, and the judge is certainly gonna ask you that question, what are you owed? He's gonna tell you that your order of possession is no longer valid. And you're gonna have an obligation to turn possession back over to the owner. The question that, that I've been asked, and I, there's no wonderful answer to, what happens if there's nobody to turn the possession over to? Okay, especially in the winter, your pipes freezing. If there's nobody that's going to be there, I don't know what a judge is gonna say about that. If you stand up in front of him and say, judge, you know, we're made whole, but this thing is gonna just sit there. Either the person's deceased and there's no estate, the bank isn't coming after it yet. I envision a judge probably allowing you to keep possession. Make it, make it a useful uh, uh, unit as opposed to just sitting there. Because you're gonna say to the judge, judge, in two months, they're gonna be delinquent again and I'm just gonna be back. So the judge is likely to give you, to continue to give you possession under the right circumstances. Does anybody have any questions about that? Kirk? Yeah, let's say you um, lease a tenant that does, in fact, um, clean out the kitchen, take cabinets, everything. Your tenant so that, did that? Let's say it. Okay. I'm a landlord separately and I've had tenants do things like that. So let's say, though, we rent 
the unit out and they destroy it somehow. Yep. Since we're in possession, are we then liable to bring that back up to the condition it was in when we took possession? That's a really, really good question. The reality is this, you as a landlord, you as a association, you become landlord, you become responsible for the, the condition of the unit and certain things are able to be passed back to the owner. Okay, some of what you're telling me is a crime, right? If somebody is essentially uh, converting property to their own. Um, additionally, you have a contract with them, okay? So you have con contractual rights. So a number of things come out of what you just said. You certainly have a breach of contract claim against the tenant. I'm sure they're not sticking around, right? right. Um, you do have the right to pass back the reasonable expenses to bring the associate to bring the unit into a condition to rent. So whether or not a judge awards you that money, whether or not you're entitled to it, that's that's pretty much outside of an attorney's hands. That's going to be a judge to decide. You go in and say, Judge, we had to spend fifty thousand dollars because the place got looted. I don't know if a judge is going to tell you to split that with the owner. They're getting the benefit of you doing the work, right? So they're still on title. If you fix the property and somebody and they come back, they got the benefit of that fifty thousand dollars. So my argument would be is that they benefit from that, and there should be insurance on the property. Right, but if if we put a if we put a tenant correct, and that tenant does some damage to the property. Sure. So I'm assuming we're we would be responsible for any damage that tenant did. I, you know, we're never going to yeah. find the tenant. You're in a bit of a gray area. I'm hoping that there's insurance for a scenario like this. Uh, but yeah, the association does take risk. When you play landlord, let's let's face it, you're 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 taking on some risk. And I have some associations that flat out say, "Thank you, Illinois, for this wonderful statute, but we don't want to be landlords because then we have to pick the tenants and we have to play landlord. We have to pay somebody to manage them. Essentially, I get it. I don't agree with that decision." Arguably, you're breaching your fiduciary duty to, to recover assessments by just letting it sit. Um, so I, you're in a bit of a gray area. But yeah, the association is taking some risk there. Yes, ma'am. We had a situation that we were granted concessions. How many concessions are granted? Because we went in, they had already moved out. So we <coughs> the locks, had contracted there to see what needed to be done to bring it up to speed. And within two weeks, somebody else came in the locks again because they had possession because we are we are an association we also have there's a master association so they were delinquent in assessments to us also delinquent to the master association okay your your association's governing documents okay whether or not somebody took the time to look at them the mass either the master association or the underlying association has the right to enforce non-payment of assessments I look at these types of declarations all the time, and the, the fact that both of them attempted to enforce and get orders of possession, yes. it happens. Kind of shame on the judge for not recognizing one of them didn't have the right to seek possession. Most of the time, the order of possession, the right to seek uh, recovery of assessments belongs to the underlying association, Is not the master. Filed? It's not yet, yeah, it's, it's purely in the language of the governing documents. So the declaration is gonna say, who has the right to, to collect and to pursue non-payment of assessments? Because in this situation, when they write a check, I'm assuming they don't write two checks, they don't write a check they to do. the, they do in your situation? Yes. Okay, I mean, in reality, that scenario should never happen where there's two separate competing associations going for an order of possession. Um, and that's, that is a very, very novel scenario that that happened. So, well, yeah, and the reality is this, this the, the, the most recent order of possession is the valid one. So if somebody came along with a secondary order of possession, they, they supersede the, the previous order of possession. So if the master was the second in time, the master is the one who has the valid order of possession. It's probably even way more complicated by if a bank forecloses, they just wipe out both of the orders because they have a superior right of possession. Yeah, because they get for two years. Because the reality is this, if you have, if you have that money judgment, and the master, I mean, you have a battle of people <coughs> dying to be a landlord, which is odd. I would happily let the master be the landlord and have them pay a portion of the money that they recover to you. Because you have a, still have a valid money judgment. You still have a judgment that you could enforce against the master. I go to court and say, judge, the master association took possession from us. We want to, from their proceeds that they're collecting, I want them to be making a payment to us each month. 
I, I would assume that's I would assume that just um, I would assume that's what a judge would do with that because you still have a money judgment. Yes, ma'am. So is it only only forcibles that go into effect after January first? They must have a lease commenced within eight months. It's or? yes. It's going to be orders of, and this this is my interpretation. Okay, because this is the question that comes up. When does this go into effect? It's going to be judgments that are entered after the first of the year. So that's going to be a judgment happens on the 3rd of January. There's still going to be a stay period and then eight months. <coughs> it's not going to, there's not going to be some reach back. So for instance, if I, I, I'm working with a woman now who she they, her association filed a forcible and, and they retained the unit, but it's been over 10 months and they haven't put in. Yeah, I mean, if the judgment predates the January, my, my position would be is I certainly would make a demand and try to use that on them. Yeah. Because again, I, that's my interpretation. And only a judge is gonna be the one to tell me I'm wrong. My wife, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. The bank is, and I touched on this a second ago. The bank's right to possession is superior over anything that we do as an association. Their mortgage right, they can come in, and that's why the dirt, one of the four-letter words is, is foreclosure. The bank has the right to come in and wipe out our right of possession, and wipe in some instances, and the, the whole six-month thing, wipe out a good chunk of the money we're owed, um, and that's that's the race that that we internally battle and the lawyers battle about is the race to get possession. The quicker we can get possession, the quicker we can start recovering money before the bank comes in. We can do it in you know six, seven, eight months, and the bank is sometimes, you know, it's getting better, but it was we have some foreclosures that have gone on for four years. Now that's come down, it's more like, you know, you know, eighteen to twenty four. It's it's really come down a long ways. Um, but it's we can get it with with over a year at a minimum, if we do it quick enough. And the, the bank still has to honor the lease. No, the, there's actually, so if you're doing a lease, this is something you should be very careful with. You want your lease to have a relatively short out clause. When I say relatively short, 30, 60, I wouldn't go much more than 60 days in your short-term lease agreement to allow the association, if in fact the, the property is foreclosed on, there's just, there's just language we've added to uh, residential lease uh, documents that the association has to have that out. There is no, the, at the end of the day, if the bank comes in and tells you, now this, this differs by the way for Chicago, because Chicago has its own, uh, its own ordinance, uh, but generally speaking, you wanna be careful about that dispute. You really do, you wanna have the right to get out of those if you need to. Now, I've already negotiated with banks though and said, We'll split, we'll split the rent with you. We'll give, you're just gonna sit on the asset. At, at the end of the day, when they foreclose, banks don't even know what properties they have. They have so much inventory, they, you know, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. So we're gonna actually have a beneficial land, uh, tenant in there. We're gonna manage the property. And until you tell us that you're going to dispose of the property, I've negotiated with banks and they've agreed to that. Um, that's based on what the bank's interests are. Some banks say, we don't care. We want that person out. It's our asset. So, so give us direction as to what should be in the lease. Yes, you should talk to your lawyer. Thank you. Okay, last one. Okay, um, order of possession. It's on assessments only, not violations or late fees. Correct. <laughs> so you cannot. So one of the questions that comes into me is somebody has left their garbage can out for a year and a half, and we've been finding them fifty dollars a day, and it's big enough now that we want to file a lawsuit. Well, that's a, yeah, that's a, that's a big, that's a big uh, amount of fines. The reality is the only time that you can file a forcible is as it relates to assessments. That can be special assessments, but if it, and you, and it can be a combination of the two. So if you have unpaid assessments, we will file a forcible and seek non-assessment amounts in that, but you have to have some amount of it has to be assessments. Um, otherwise, you will immediately be transferred out of the, the forcible courtrooms and you'll be sent over. To, and it's a breach of contract case at that point. If it's purely unpaid fines, fees, whatever it may be, 
Um, that is a breach of contract case. They are breaching the governing documents, and that's how it must be filed. Good question, though. Okay, sir, last one. Um, <coughs> for payments, I've, I've been in an association where they've said any payments that you make go towards fines first. Wrong. Okay. The, the reality is this. There is case law that says you can't have fines on top of fines. And what the, prop, the proposition is, if you have a bunch of money that's owed and somebody sends in their assessment check, you apply that to that month's assessment first, and then anything over that assessment amount can be applied to the old amounts owed. The, pro, the idea is you can't apply that to the old because you're going to put a fine on top. Each month they would accrue a fine. And there is case law in Illinois that addresses that very issue, that you essentially can't have fines accruing because, you're, the, because of the way you apply their payments. They're making timely payments. They could be contesting something that you put on their account. Um, so if they're making the assessment account payment, you pay that amount first, and then anything over and above can be paid um, essentially at your, however you want to pay it. They would go, usually go to the oldest, anything over that they pay, okay? Okay. The last one, before we get into the lovely cases, um, is the service of process. Not a lot to be discussed here. You gotta open the door now. This applies more to people downtown. Um, if you have like a doorman, high-rise buildings, if you live in a gated community, uh, the days of, of not letting the person in, and a special process server saying, well, I couldn't serve them because I couldn't get past the doorman, that's what the purpose of this is, is to stop that from happening. Somebody asked me a question though, what happens when the doorman lets them in? You don't have an obligation to let them to, to open the door to them upstairs, right? So they can knock, they can knock till their hand is raw on your front door, and if you don't answer the door, that service is still not valid. Um, so it doesn't get past the full issue, but it gets them past the doorman. I will say this: you should have, if you have this scenario, get photocopies of people's driver's license. Do something. Because the next big lawsuit is going to be you let somebody in and they robbed a house or they committed some crime after you just waved them in. No, you need to know who, you, there's nothing in here that says you can't question the person. There's nothing in here that says you can't follow the person up to the unit with, you know, walk with them. Uh, it just says you have to grant them access. Yes, ma'am. Um, this actually happened to us and basically we had <coughs> um, the, the, I don't know what you call them, that, that uh, serves as the, um, and they basically threatened the board member and basically said they we had to let them in. And when did it, did it happen after this? Or? No, it happened before. Okay, I mean, he, listen. No, he, even after though, even I'm more concerned about after at this point. Sure. I thought it was only if they're paid, it's an employee. So, I mean, a board member is not an employee. We didn't need to let them in even now, do we? Listen, you're dealing in a bit of a gray area. I mean, really. I mean, how, how much a court is going to extend the actual language of the statute. By the way, I don't have the actual language here, I just have bullet points. Mm -hmm. The reality is, <clears throat> I don't have a problem with you questioning the credentials and making sure that the person is who he says he is, mm -hmm. that he's in, 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 you know, making sure that he is in fact serving process um, on a witness or it's his witness or a, a litigant. <clears throat> so I don't think it's gonna be that big of a leap when a judge says that also extends to a board member. That's my opinion. Um, I understand what you're saying, though, that you hire people to watch your door, presumably, or to, you know, to, to make that decision. Um, but you know, you're in a position at the association to grant access. Um, you're in a position of power as a board member. Um, so I don't think it would be a big stretch for a judge to say that that applies to, to board members also. Um, any other questions? <clears throat> OK. Let's get into the case law real quickly. We've got about 20 minutes. Um, the first case, very, very impactful. 1010 uh, Lakeshore Association. This kind of goes back to the whole discussion about the six month things, uh, the six month uh, idea where you're entitled to recover your uh, six months, uh, but in situations of a foreclosure, you might have a scenario where a whole bunch of, of pre six months does, you're not entitled to it. It just gets wiped out. Well, in this particular scenario, and uh, one of my partners, Michael Schiffer, represents this association, <coughs> you run into the issue with banks, okay? So a bank takes title after a foreclosure. And the banks, I don't know if it's the, the fact that they're smug or they are indifferent, uh, but what happens after they take title after a foreclosure is 
they'll just wait around until they have a third party buyer um, and until they divest themselves of the property, it's very common that they just thumb their nose at the assessments. They say, you know what, we're a bank, we're not gonna pay it. Um, they're deep pockets. So we were always successful in going into court and suing banks because we know they're gonna pay, they got money. It's just a matter of getting a judge to tell them to pay it. Well, in this particular case, um, the court decided to kind of push back. And what they said, because this particular bank, Deutsche Bank, died, decided not to pay the post foreclosure assessments for a number of months. A lawsuit was filed. The court said, not only bank are you required to pay the post foreclosure assessments, but if you don't begin the first day after you take title to begin to meet your obligation on assessments, and if lawsuit is filed, the association can be awarded pre foreclosure money owed. That is a hugely impactful scenario because that's not only addressing the six months in that window, it's the money that's been owed. In this particular case, it was a very large sum of money that was owed for many, 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 many moons before the six months. And this was the associate, the, the, the court's rationale was the bank is in the best position to meet their obligations post assessment, post foreclosure. They're in the best position to, uh, to make good on if they're going to not meet their, their burden after the foreclosure, they're in the best position to make the association whole. Now I can tell you that the banks are pretty big and they have lobbyists. So as I stand here, we're filing these lawsuits like crazy and this is good case law in Illinois. What I can tell you is that I can't, I, I can't tell you what's gonna happen in six months. If there's, if there's gonna be legislation, if, the, if this is going to go up to the Illinois State Supreme Court and there's going to be some way, you know, they're going to weigh in on that, um, I don't know. It's kind of to be continued. But as we stand here right now, this is binding case law in the first district. It's persuasive case law in all other districts. And I think it opens the door to, to force banks. Somebody told me to force banks to pay. Somebody told me the other day that they had the same issue and it was the same bank and they brought this case to their attention and they got a check literally the next day. So their t banks are taking notice of this case law. Um, so it's something to have in your back pocket. It's something if you're a lawyer, I mean, if, you, if, if you're represented by KSN, we're very well aware of it. Some other lawyers may not be, but it's another arrow in your quiver to go after uh, delinquent assessments that, that are related with foreclosures because that's where we really can be burned as associations. Anybody have any questions on that case? Yes, ma'am. Uh, ICPA only or? Say that again? ICPA only? Yes. Not Good point. Now here's, here's the issue though. That's as, so this was a condo. No questions asked. Very similar, similarly to what I'm gonna say about Palm in a second. It's not going to be a stretch when this is expanded to townhomes or HOAs. The reality is very similar concepts about non-payment of assessments after foreclosures. So if there is a six month provision as there is in the Common Interest Community Association Act, very similarly to what there is in the Condo Act, it's not a stretch to think that the courts are going to follow this case. So it's persuasive you can authority. You to argue anyway. Well yeah, I mean I could argue about it all day long. Um, we can get I, the banks and argue with it. I, I certainly see the idea behind this was to penalize banks for not, they're in the best position to meet their obligations and for them to thumb their nose at associations which can only exist based on assessments, this was a pushback. Um, so I would say the answer is I think that this would be extended to all associations. Any other questions on that? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, if uh, a bank when they take possession immediately begins paying the assessments, does that mean you can't go after them for the prior? Correct. Session? It cuts off your right. First of all, you have no claim against them now because they, their obligation only begins the day that they take title. Okay? So your cause of action for pre-foreclosure is either the prior owner or the subsequent purchaser because that's who you can go after the six months from is the subsequent purchaser. So the bank has a very limited window of obligation, which is probably what upset the court so much, is that, guys, we're not asking the world of you, bank, and you still can't even pay your bills. So I think that's, you know, the answer is no, because there is no actual claim against the bank. It's if they fumble um, when they have the obligation that they've just expanded what you can get. Yes, ma'am. So 
So when a bank foreclosures and takes possession of that property, they are supposed to be paying the assessment? Yes, when they are on title. Now, the, the question that I've been asked before, though, is let's say that there is a, uh, a sheriff's sale and essentially title passes pat through the bank and there's a, there's a, a third party purchaser. This case wouldn't apply. This case only applies in scenarios where the bank actually takes title to the property for some appreciable amount of time. So they actually have to hold the asset long enough to blow their obligation to pay an assessment before this even applies. And how do you know that? How long they're on title? Well, you're, you're going to be an integral part of any closing because they're going to seek a paid assessment letter from you. They're going to seek input from the association, or they should. I mean, it happened. Closings happen without paid assessment letters, unfortunately. Um, so it's based on, I mean, it's going to be based on information given to you, but the only way you're ever going to try to use this is if they blow that requirement for a, a couple well, of months. I was wondering about that empty property that we had for two years. We thought the bank had, assessed, had possession of it. Now, shouldn't our, we had an attorney. Should not <laughs> attorney? Hopefully he wasn't here. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, the attorneys, listen, one of the things that, one of the things that lawyers do is they, they monitor foreclosures. Right. So, Remember, a foreclosure action, while, while the association is a named party in the foreclosure action, they're not an integral party, so you don't even go to court on it. You just get notices of what's happening. Right. <clears throat> so you may very well have either been on notice or you could have easily found out what was going on with the foreclosure case. Mm -hmm. Likelihood is that it was still pending. It was just the, the banks just keep kicking the can down the road and they don't ever complete the foreclosure for great periods of time. But had they done that really quickly and been on title, then this would have been this case would have applied in your situation. Okay. Let's we have about 15 minutes. Let's move on to everybody's favorite topic, Gary Palm. Um, okay, so I already can tell you that in 2015, there's a already legislation and people talking about how to counteract the effects of, of Palm. They've even formed a, a committee uh, downtown for part of the Chicago Bar Association. And lo and behold, one of the people on that committee to undo Gary Palm's doings is Gary Palm. <laughs> so I can tell you that he may very well have been somewhat shocked by the, the overreaching nature of what the findings were. Or he just really likes to stick people. Because um, he's, he's, he's on the email chain. I'm on the same group. And Gary Palm sends emails about Gary Palm. So it's, it's interesting. Um, but so anybody who's lived under a rock, the, the long and the short of the Palm case is 2800 Lakeshore Drive Condo Association was an association who Gary Palm was on the board of directors for a, quite a while. He went off the board. I have to assume that it was a nasty divorce. You know, sometimes when people leave the board, they don't all of a sudden, you know, they're not on holiday card lists anymore with each other. And in this particular case, Gary Palm started asking a lot of questions. I want to see all the records. He was making records requests all the time. He was starting to ask questions about the notice, the, the way they were noticing their meetings, the fact that they weren't really holding meetings, the way they were voting on things, uh, the way they were transferring reserves from you know, operating to reserves and not following what the declaration actually said about that topic. The reality of the case was you had a really bad association that wasn't following what their document said and wasn't following the Condo Act, and you had Gary Palm, who was the perfect storm litigant. He was a retired law professor, or is a retired law professor. <clears throat> he did constitutional law for, for kicks. You know, what you and I do, you know, I go to Cubs games, I go to you know, sporting events. What he does for kicks is litigate. He, because he doesn't have to pay a lawyer, he doesn't pay himself. He has instant access to the court system, and it's his hobby. So you had, you know, and I say this to boards all the time, there's maybe only one or two Gary Palms in the state of Illinois. Um, that's, and, and he's obviously one of them. So the reality is uh, nobody has, usually has the fortitude to litigate for 13 years, which is what he did. This went on for a very, very, very long time. He went up and back to the appellate court three separate times. Um, and the final um, opinion, which is the one that everybody you know, started crying in their soup about, state, you know, stated a number of important things. Most importantly, what it is or how it is that you as a board can conduct business and what it means to conduct business. Managers had it wrong for a long time. Lawyers certainly had it wrong for a long time. We were running around for probably decades believing that 
conducting business meant the votes, the actual votes. You're actually conducting the moment that you do business, you're conducting it, you're voting. Well, the appellate court decided that that's not necessarily the case. That also expands to discussions. Uh, and that's mm -hmm. horribly impactful because with technology, we spent some time talking about it, I get discussions from boards 85 times a day. It's a reply, somebody hits reply all, I'm somehow on the email chain. That under poem, if you hit reply all and it's more than a quorum of the board, part of a discussion, part of you know, talking about the landscaper who you know, looks like an idiot, whatever it might be, that's a discussion and it requires under poem notice so that owners can be present to watch you transact and discuss board business. Now, there are certainly uh, ways around it. Lawyers, that's what we're somewhat good at, is finding end runs around everything. Um, so without going into crazy detail, there are ways around Palm. But the, th the, the key takeaways are follow your governing documents. If it says you have to post notice and mail or hand deliver, that's a mouthful. There's three different things there, but you have to do one of them is or, one of them is and. Follow what it says. That's not a big mind blower. Just do what your documents say. If your documents say that you have to credit um, excess operating funds as opposed to just rolling them over blindly to your reserves, you got to do it. It's what it says you got to do. Um, if you know if it says you got to hold X number of meetings and it says you got a meeting's got to be on the moon, okay, guess what? You got to meet on the moon, or you got to change your documents. Um, so the, the takeaway is as far as what you can do. Um, if you want to do certain things outside of meetings, there are ways to do it. You can delegate authority. The Palm case says that you as an association have the right, as a board, to vote in an open meeting to delegate authority to your manager. And as long as the delegation is spelled out and what her parameters and what she can and cannot do, there's nothing that prohibits you from doing that. Um, what Palm didn't do, <coughs> excuse me, interestingly, is it didn't address emergencies. Okay, so there's this giant gaping hole in the 28-page opinion uh, but what, what is an association supposed to do if a tree falls on a building and collapses a roof? If you followed Palm, you would have to wait 48 hours before you could do anything because you couldn't actually do any board business without at least 48 hours notice. Well, that's nonsense. So we, you know, one of the things that KSN has been doing is adopting or drafting day-to-day um, you know, -day or emergency resolutions. But what do you do in case of a scenario like, like I just said? Well, you need to have some policy in place that allows the board president or the manager to make decisions day to day up to a certain amount or for budgeted for items. We can, we can you know, use the terminolo any terminology you want, but you just have to explicitly delegate that authority to somebody. Um, and that does not run afoul of Paul. Um, otherwise, you have to be very careful about who you're, I said before, you're, you're trouble people, the people who are, that you have to look out for. Sometimes it's you guys, every now and then. Uh, identify them. Know who your people are that you have to be careful about, right? So you don't run around and just scream about how you're going to ratify all these things in front of them. Guess what? Ratify is a dirty word. That means you did something outside of a meeting and now you're going to do it. You're going to fix it. You're going to vote on it in the meeting. Uh, you don't want to reply all. Start using BCC. If you're going to send information, nothing prohibits her from sending out information. <clears throat> What's prohibited is the person hitting reply all and responding to her to all the board members and saying, boy, I hate contractor number two. You've just discussed it. Okay, so for better or worse, you've called, a, you've inadvertently called a meeting without noticing it. Um, you have to um, potentially start trusting your managers a little more. Um, you know, in the technology age, board members, um, have become, it's, these associations have become so much more sophisticated than anybody ever envisioned. Nobody ever thought you guys were gonna care so damn much. <laughs> you hired managers, you hired lawyers, but, you, but because of these, these, this technology, you guys care now so much more. You look at the minutia, you scrutinize every aspect of a, an invoice for $50, um, and that makes their job very difficult, it makes everybody's job very difficult, and that's part of what the pushback of Palm was, and that's what the board said is, guys, you're not, as you're not as sophisticated as you think you are. Your business should be done above board, and all of your discussions and decisions should be done in front of your constituents, the people who elected you. Um, and that's no different than municipalities. That's the way municipalities are run. 
all the discussion and decisions happen in front of the anybody who wants to come to an open meeting and, and be bored to death. Um, but that's your right as an owner. So that's really the takeaway from Palm. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I know we could talk about Palm literally all night because there is a lot more to it. Uh, but that's my, my tips of the waves. Anybody? So the way. Yes, sir. Uh, we have a rule of convenience on our uh, books which can be waived by vote of the board. Uh, Define a rule of convenience. Uh, it's, it's a rule which does not permit moving in on, uh, maybe moving in or out on Saturdays okay. and Sundays. Uh, there is a provision where the board can waive that rule. That's pretty tough. Pretty hot, tough to enact that because you need a majority of the board to, to waive it. When you need a meeting for the board to vote okay. on it, the right so, to waive So it. Is, is there any workaround for something like that? Or yeah, delegate. You, the reality is, we've, I've drafted probably a thousand delegation resolutions over the last six months. Because that's all Palm says is it's okay to do things outside of meetings as long as you've appropriately delegated that authority to somebody who then brings that information back to the next meeting. Because remember, anything you do needs to get into the minutes. If, if anything you, well, one of the things I want you guys to all realize Meeting minutes, the only purpose is for five years down the road, when you guys are all on your tropical islands and there's a new board, you have, somebody has to be able to figure out what you did and how you did it and what was the vote, because that's the stuff that gets tied up in court. So if you're gonna delegate somebody authority, that's fine. The person who has the right to act with that authority comes to the next meeting and says, this is what I did based on my authority delegated to me, and now is in the meeting minutes. So, there's, so when the judge says, what in the world did that, why did that guy do that? Well, judge, here's the resolution that granted him that authority. Here's the meeting minutes where he reported it to the owners. Guess what? We've got a complete, complete situation. The big, and, and real briefly, the big thing, and I, said, I still think there's a cottage industry for an attorney. Um, I'm not trying to create a, a, a law practice, but you could successfully defend against forcible uh, lawsuits, eviction lawsuits, by the first thing you were to walk up and say to the judge is, Judge, why don't you have them show me the meeting minutes where they voted in an open meeting to turn me over to collections? That never happens. Right? Because you have either in your contract, in the management contract it says after X number of days um, or somewhere, or the board just has adopted something, you know, just randomly said they're going to, it's usually done horribly informally. And if, if the judge does what he's supposed to do, he should say, well, Either you have delegated properly delegated that authority to somebody, or you have meeting minutes that show that they were turned over to collections. Otherwise, the board never voted on it. And you can't take action. You can't put somebody into collections and incur legal fees and evict somebody if you didn't vote on it. So there's, there's a lot of implications when it comes down to, which is why one of the things I draft is collection policies. Because that policy spells out what the process is to turn them over. And that it's a mechanism after a certain number of days. That started on <clears throat> May of 14? Actually, I want to say it was, they, so in May, the initial opinion came out, and it was a Rule 23 opinion, which means it was not binding. <laughs> it was June, early June, when the Illinois Supreme Court lifted the Rule 23, I'm sorry, the Illinois Appellate Court, because the Illinois Supreme Court declined to hear the case. Um, so we were all waiting around to see if they were going to undo the damage, and the Illinois Supreme Court said, no, we want nothing to do with it. Um, so it was in June, I want to say, when, the, okay. when it actually became binding authority. Oh, and I said I was going to bring this up, and i got to move on to the next case here. Um, this was a condo association in Cook County. So somebody, a townhome association in Winnebago County in Rockford, calls me up and says, does this apply to me? Well, the major provision in, in Palm talks about conducting business, and there's a definition about what it means to be, con you know, the whole discussion about business being conducted, that's identical language in the Common Interest Community Association Act. Therefore, any lawyer that tells you not to follow Palm is crazy because it's not going to be a leap of faith for a judge to apply that to all associations. So do you want to be in court for 13 years, you know, arguing that question, or you just want to follow Palm as best you can? Um, okay, I'm going to move on to the last one. we got about five minutes. Last one is uh, Spanish Court 2. Um, as I said before, one of my partners, Diane Silverberg, argued this. 
um, in front of the Supreme, Illinois Supreme Court. Um, and this kind of got under, overshadowed, by the way, when this, when this opinion came out, it was like days before Palm came out. So Diana was you know, getting all of her suits already, and she thought she was going to be on TV. And then Palm came out, and she completely got wiped off the, the map. So it's pretty, we laugh about it internally, because she thought it was going to be her moment in the sun. Uh, not so much. Anyway, what it says was, and I actually, in the very beginning of this case, um, I was involved in the litigation, because I litigated in the beginning of my career. Um, Spanish Court II, again, like 2800 Lakeshore, was kind of a nasty association that had a big problem with Lisa Carlson. Lisa Carlson owns a unit up on top. She has a cracked uh, sliding glass window. The roof is caving in. There's water leaking in. But the board can't stand her because she's annoying. I'm just telling you what I was told. Um, and they did nothing. They were not fixing any of her things. And her response was, I'm just going to stop paying my assessments. You're not supplying me with, with any services. You're not doing the things you're required to do. Therefore, I shouldn't have to pay assessments. And I see some logic in that. But the current or the state of the law in Illinois always was that those two things were not linked together. That you had an affirmative requirement to pay your assessments no matter what was going on at your association. So, and, and to put in a practical, a practical discussion, if you could use it as a defense, and first of all, everybody would. They'd say that, the, you know, that you didn't clean the carpet or there's cobwebs over here. You would turn the daily center in every courthouse over. They would tip over with lawsuits, and, and the cases would last a lot longer. When we used to litigate these cases, you'd stand in front of a judge and, and you'd say, judge, this person owes me this money. The judge would look at the person and say, do you owe those assessments? The person would say yes, the judge would, done. Next case. Well, if you have that automatic right of a defense, that's not going to be as quick of a case, and you're going to have a lot of arguments. Well, any of you know Lake County, Illinois, they are a very progressive uh, court system. They have some crazy theories at times. Well, they actually sided with Lisa Carlson. Um, and they said, yeah, they're tied together. If you're not doing your job, then she shouldn't have to pay assessments. Um, and that's why I went up to the state Supreme Court. And the state Supreme Court essentially, well, they overturned the appellate court's position and said they're not tied to each other. If the person isn't paying their assessments, it doesn't matter if you guys are doing a lousy job as a board. And you, the reality is they still have that right or that obligation to pay assessments. Anybody have any questions on that? All the way around? If somebody doesn't pay their assessments, do you have an obligation to do maintenance? Well, they have, and here's what came out of that, because the, there was two cases that were filed. There was the forcible case that we filed, and she sued the association for, for uh, failure to maintain, essentially breach of fiduciary duty. That, the courts basically said that's her cause of action. That's what she, her, her uh, right is is to use the court system if they're not going to do the work. So if I understand what you're saying, it's not vice versa. Yeah, what I'm saying is if, 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 a, if someone is not paying an assessment that becomes severely delinquent for mm -hmm. whatever reason, can you decline to do maintenance on their limited common elements or whatever? I mean, at your peril. You're, you have an obligation, a contractual obligation under your governing documents to maintain the the limit common element, common element, whatever the things may be, whatever your documents mm -hmm. say. So is that your own deal? You are breaching the, doc the government documents. Okay, the last topic for tonight, and I know we're, we're short on time here, the Ombudsperson Act. You guys may have heard about this. It was one of the last things Governor Quinn did before he actually staged left. Um, the idea behind this is, and it really does track Florida entirely, because Florida had this whole thing happen a couple of years ago, and uh, what it is is a mechanism for members to uh, have some assistance in their disputes rather than having to file lawsuits and having, you know, having to expend the money to go to court. The, the Illinois is trying to set up this ombudsperson uh, situation where associations first, and I'll tell you the, the timeline, which is kind of the ridiculous part about it, they have to, all associations by January 1st of 2017 are going to have to have um, dispute resolution policies in place, conflict resolution policies. You're going to have to have some policies so they know who do they complain to, what kind of response time will they get. Um, they want to make sure that associations have some way for the members to be able to get themselves uh, addressed. So that's 2017 on January 1st. By 2019, January 1st of 2019, the state will actually appoint an ombudsperson. 
that person will act as a mediator for the disputes between the association and those members. Here's the kicker. It's voluntary. Both sides have to agree to go before the ombudsperson. So my takeaway is a couple things. One, it's going to be legislated. There's going to be legislation on a legislation between now and then. So I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock, and I wouldn't go run out and draft your policy tomorrow, because it's probably going to be changing. And two, it doesn't force you to do anything other than adopt a policy, which you probably should have anyway. There's nothing wrong with having a conflict resolution policy. Don't you want your members to know who they should contact or what mechanism they should use if they're being mistreated? I would say yes. It formalizes the policy. It takes the power out of the board's hands from Lisa Carlson. They just didn't like her. So they decided to thumb their nose at her. Well, at least now there would be some kind of a policy in place that they could be held to. Um, any questions on that? What was the name of the act? It's called the Ombuds, I believe it's called the Ombudsman Act, but that's, okay. that's not PC. So they call it the Ombudsperson Act. Um, <laughs> Yes? Well, it's not on this one. You didn't mention the insurance change. Oh, you know what? I did not. Give me, give me two more minutes. The insurance changes. Very impactful. Wow, I can't believe I missed it. Only condos. Yeah. yeah, only condos for the insurance, insurance changes. They go into effect June 1st. What happened with those changes, and how did I miss that? Um, <laughs> break. Oh, we went on break. Okay. So, the reality of the changes, real quickly, is that what it did is it expanded what the insurance policies must contain for directors and officers' policies. It now must contain, this is policies written after June 1st of 2015, they must contain provisions for non-monetary actions, uh, defensive breach of contract, very big, because a lot of the times insurance companies will say, oh, we've got an exclusion for breach of contract. That's what we face all the time. Now they must have a provision, uh, have policy for that. Additional, the other interesting one is the decisions related to placement or adequacy of insurance. So in other words, if you as board members screw up the insurance and you don't get the right coverage that's required, they now have an obligation to cover you for having bad coverage. The insurance company? Yes. The policy must include that. Additionally, they got rid of, or I'm sorry, they expanded the definition and explained it better of improvements or betterments uh, because there's always a question about who is supposed to pay for the new cabinets. That's explained better now. Um, and then uh, they got rid of, you know, there was a provision, interestingly, that allowed the association, you guys as a board, to buy insurance for members who didn't have insurance. But if you ever tried to do that, you'd find out it's impossible because insurance companies require you to be on title to write a policy for you. So they just removed that provision. So no longer, it's not even in the Condo Act because it was an impossibility. Uh, so the takeaway, though, the last thing, the very last line, the amendment only applies to insurance policies issued or renewed after the June 1st date. So if you get your policy renewed at the end of May, this doesn't apply to that. So I might hold out and try to get it, because this, this does, there's two effects. One, it's going to increase the coverage, but that means it's going to increase the policy. You're going to pay more, too. But at the end of the day, directors and officers insurance protects you guys. You want as much protection as you guys can get as volunteers. Okay. Any questions on insurance? That's going to be handled by the insurance company anyway. They're going to say, these are the new provisions. After Here's June okay. first. You open Pandora's box because there is case law right now, and my firm is handling it or handled it. They were asked that question. So whose responsibility is it for to determine adequacy of insurance? And the, the courts came back and said the board, not the insurance company. But that's why the one idea of saying uh, decisions related to placement or adequacy of insurance <laughs> It's just, it's circular thinking. Yeah. Okay, so you make the mistake, they still gotta cover you. So it's just gonna, this was their, I, I feel like this was the effect of that case. Yeah, one of my partners, Nick Mitchell, the court, the appellate court said, you, uh, the association members and board has the obligation to determine whether or not they're complying with the Condo Act. Well, that makes me cringe because I'm not an insurance, I'm gonna, that makes me look at a lot of policies. It's not my area of expertise, it's certainly not yours, I don't think. Um, so it, it creates an issue, but now you have coverage for getting wrong coverage. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any other questions for Michael or Mary at this time?
Mary, do you ever speak? <laughs> I feel, it's hard to get words in edgewise with a lawyer. I, I knew this going in, it was going to be that way. In fact, I, one of my partners and I spoke together, and I didn't even let him talk. Michael yeah. Shepard was with me last week, and he sat pretty much silently the whole time. So I, I have a problem with that. Uh, spotlight. You have a partner, you're a better person, huh? No, no not, I work well best of luck. Michael, thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. We look forward to seeing you at the next uh, seminar that we put on. Thank you all. Have a safe trip home.